கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா Namaste and welcome to another episode of Ananya Bhakti. So today we're going to talk about duality and non-duality. In other words, when people talk about non-dual philosophy, meditation and so on, usually they only talk about how do you reach non-duality? But that means then we lack the understanding of how to come out of the non-dual state back into duality again. <laughs> This leads to some very comical uh, phenomena, such as people clinging to non-duality. <laughs> And you can see it's an effort. You can see it in their faces. They're making an effort to cling to non-duality even when they're trying to act within duality. And of course, it creates a tremendous tension. And you can see this in their faces. You can see it in their eyes. This is what I call a immature Advaitin. Somebody who hasn't realized the whole package. <laughs> They're still struggling to reach non-duality, which of course is a, a total contradiction in terms because if you're struggling, who is struggling? What is that struggle? It means there's a distinction, a division, a difference between I and self. So they're not in non-duality at all. because they're struggling. And this is why Osho and others say that you can't realize until you give up this struggle, until you stop trying. And so last time we went over what I call dissolution, where you go into non-duality until you simply become the self. But today I want to talk about the dance. Huh? The dance of going between duality and non-duality, which is the real life of the realized being. The flickering mind is constantly fluctuating between varying degrees of non-dual self-attentiveness and inversely proportionate degrees of dualistic thinking. Therefore, our love for being correspondingly fluctuates between expression as non-dual self-love and its expression as dualistic love for God. In other words, it's not that we realize non-dual consciousness and that that's the end. No. because we still have to live out the prarabdha karma of this body. So even if we attain or become qualified for moksha, ultimate liberation from samsara, we still have to go back and forth between the non-dual state and the dual state. And of course, that's going to be different. Huh? There is going to be a dance, a flow, a movement, a vibration back and forth. Uh, so uh, you never read about this in books. They're always talking about how do you get to the non-dual state? How do you get to the non-dual state? Well, okay, well, once you get to the non-dual state, then what? You just sit there like a stone? Uh, you just let the body drop and you disappear? You know, there was a cartoon back in the hippie days. I wish I could find it on the internet. I've looked for it. I can't find it. So I'm just going to have to describe it. 
In Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco, there's a Poroshki shop. Poroshkis are these little Russian pastries like dumplings, and they have various different fillings and so forth. They're like, if you're Jewish, they're like kreplach. Uh, or if you're Indian, they're like samosas. So anyway, these guys, these hippies are sitting in the shop. There's two hippies, sitting, friends on one side, and there's this one guy on the other side, and he starts talking, say, the distinctions of dualistic reality are simply an illusion. Actually, none of this actually exists. It's just a seeming projection of our own minds. And, so, and he goes on talking like this, right? And gradually he fades out. <laughs> he gets lighter and lighter and finally he just disappears. <laughs> and so the two hippies on the other side, one says to the other, wow, man, dude had a beautiful head. <laughs> And the other one says, yeah, can I have his Poroshki? <laughs> so this is the thing. <laughs> we are the self. Yet, we live in a dualistic world. Huh? And we can't just erase that by some artificial mental adjustment. We can't simply disappear. It doesn't work like that. Uh, yeah, maybe there were some uh, private Buddhas. Uh, the Buddha talked about private Buddhas. He said some of them, they attained, but they never announced it. They never declared it. They never made their lions roar. So nobody knew. And maybe they were just sitting in some jungle someplace. And they said, oh, man, nobody's going to understand this. I don't want to live in this world. Bye. And they just disappeared. Maybe there have been some people like that. Of course, we don't know. But the reality for most of us is, even if we're able to attain, we still have the body and we have to care for it. And of course, it's a tremendous opportunity to help others. So we have to live in duality. Also, well, how do we live? That was the big question that came to me in Sri Lanka after realizing fourth path. It's like, now, how do I live in the world like this? <laughs> so this is the answer. Therefore, in the life of any realized being, the non-dual love for self and the dualistic love for God will be intimately mixed, intertwined, and blended. Because in essence, those two forms of love are both forms of the same single love, just to be. So to be, whether we're being in duality or being in non-duality, is still being. So we can still love it just as much. It's not that we have to have a standoffish attitude like, ew, duality, Ugh. I don't want to, I don't want to touch it. I don't want to get involved, Ugh. right? And you see this in the symptom of people clinging to duality, especially teachers. Huh? They'll take up like a policy of this is not real, this doesn't really exist. This is all just an illusion. And you see that tension in their face, huh? that fear in their eyes, that, oh, I don't want to get involved in this duality again. Or maybe it's just actually a fear of non-duality, that, oh, I'm going to have to give up my ego. Uh-oh. <laughs> you know, it could be either or probably both. Because the people who are focused and fixated and obsessed with non-duality are going to resist both ways. They're going to resist losing their ego and going into non-dual being. And they're also going to resist coming out of non-duality into duality because they haven't fully realized it. 
But we see somebody like Bhagavan, like Ramana. He's completely comfortable. He's not making any effort. He's not struggling. Either way, he can deal with non-duality or duality. Either way. The intermingling of these two forms of a devotee's love for being is beautifully expressed by Sri Bhagavan in his devotional verses. Some of these verses are very clear expressions of non-dual love for our essential being, while others appear to be expressions of love for God as a seemingly separate supreme power of love, grace, and compassion. So if we look through Bhagavan's work, and especially his devotional works, which we're going to take up in a following series, then these two forms of expression appear to be intermingled and mixed. Huh? And of course, we're going to give many, many examples of this, just right, not right now, because I first want to create the background, the context for understanding those verses. So really what's happening is that, okay, the being who becomes realized, who realizes Brahman, who becomes the self, also has one foot in duality because the body still has to run out the prarabdha karma. So how does he manifest? How does he express this? How does he... Uh, express his love for being in the context of duality as love for God. So he creates devotional verses. And this is a question that will trip up any false teacher. Why did Shankaracharya write verses, bhakti verses in praise of Govinda? Why? When he was teaching Kevala, Advaita, unmixed non-duality. If he's really teaching unmixed non-duality, then why did he write a, a Bhajagovinda, for example? Huh? Or the Buddha. If the Buddha actually realized the non-duality, then why did he come back and teach? You see? And the answer to both of these is that this was an expression of love for God. God can be worshipped as Ishwara, as Shiva, or Govinda, or whatever form of God you like. Or God can be worshipped as the Jiva, the living entities. And that's the path that Buddha took. Remember in the Upadesha Sara, Bhagavan talked about eight forms of God. The five elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether, uh, the sun, the moon, and jiva. So any of these can be worshipped. Sun and moon mean devas, uh, the God forms. But any of these can be worshipped with devotion by an advaitin by a realized, non-dual being. This is the secret. However, most of these verses can be interpreted as an expression of either the non-dual form of love or the dualistic form of love, depending on our state of mind as we read, sing, or meditate upon them. Just like there are two schools of bhakti, Anya Bhakti, that treats God as a separate being, and Ananya Bhakti, that treats God as the self. Of course, we follow Ananya Bhakti. That's what this series is all about. But you can look at it either way, depending on your stage of realization. If you really think that you are a separate individual being, fine, worship God as separate from you. And if you really realize that you are the self, the one consciousness, the essence, then worship God as being one with you 
is fine either way. Through his devotional verses, Sri Bhagavan has taught us by example how we must depend entirely upon God, both in our external life when our mind is active and in our internal life when our mind subsides into the depth of our true being. So either way, we're only depending on the self. And if we think we're separate, or if we happen to be in a dualistic state of mind due to having to care for the body or to perform some service to God, then that's fine. We can worship God in that way too. When our minds are turned outwards, we must depend upon God as the all-loving power of grace, which is constantly reminding us of the need to turn inwards. And when our minds are turned inwards, we depend upon God as the same all-loving power of grace, which shines within us as the peace and joy of our silent being. This bliss of self-love draws our mind ever deeper within by its irresistible power of natural attraction. So the beauty of this all-embracing love is incomparable. There is nothing and can be nothing so beautiful, so wonderful as this love. So much pleasure as to make us completely forget about the world of duality, huh? all the nasty stuff, huh? the craziness, the insanity, the lies, the false promises, the betrayals. Just drop all of that and go into the love of the self, the beauty of God, which is his all-embracing love. Whenever our natural state of peace is disturbed by the rising of thoughts impelled by our deep-rooted desires, we can calm that agitation by praying to God or Guru in the manner in which Sri Bhagavan has shown us in many of these verses, which are heart-melting prayers for His grace. Why do you think we start out every single episode in this series with the Arunachala Dhyana Mantra. Huh? This is a prayer that we can use to take shelter of God in his form as Arunachala. Uh, <laughs> so if you haven't been to Arunachala, I don't expect you to understand this. <laughs> but everybody who comes and visits or stays in Arunachala for any time knows this is a fact. If anything comes up, any problem, any agitation, any distraction uh, of the mind, all we have to do is turn towards our nachala and give a little prayer, and he'll take it away. Uh, and we once again become at peace, at rest, in our non-dual realization of the self. The importance of prayer as a tool in the practice of self-investigation and self-surrender is exemplified by Sri Bhagavan in his devotional verses. Of course, God does not need us to tell him that we require his help. But that is not the true purpose of prayer. The purpose of prayer is to kindle in our heart a sense of total dependence upon God. God knows everything. He's in us. He is us. He is everything. He's everywhere with full consciousness. <laughs> so don't try to pass off anything. <laughs> You'll get busted right away. <laughs> so oh, I'm getting giddy again. <laughs> Better calm down here. Um, that God, of course, he knows we're in trouble. That is why when we are in a, a very separate, dualistic frame of mind, he tests us. He gives us messages in the fact that the material world does not respond to our desires, but does 
whatever it wants to do, <laughs> despite what we may want. And it's to show us that this desire itself is a movement in the wrong direction. So when we drop the desire and we turn towards God with prayer, suddenly things start going better. Try it. Just this simple prayer in the beginning, this Arunachala Dhyana Mantra. If you simply repeat it a few times, you will be amazed at the result. The individual mind cannot surrender and attain the state of being merely by its own effort. In fact, the very effort is going to block the attainment. We must depend entirely upon God because he alone can enable us to surrender ourself completely to him. This is the importance of dualistic devotion and prayer in the process of subsiding into the true state of absolutely non-dual self-knowledge. So everything you read is about how to get there, how to realize the self, how to subside into non-dual self-knowledge. And this is great, okay? But this can become an obsession to the point where we don't understand how we come out of that state and back into dualistic consciousness when we need to do that. So how do we do that? That's going to be the treat here at the end. I call it the process of creation. Last time we had the process of dissolution, where you dissolve the ego, dissolve the mind, and sink into the self. But how about coming out? How does that work? Well, it's the same process as the fall. But when we do it deliberately, it looks a little bit different. When we are in the self, we have complete knowledge and full consciousness of all. So if we have to come out of that, the only way is to imagine ignorance. Because there is no ignorance in the self. The only way we can come out of that is to imagine ignorance, and that is Shiva. Shiva is the guna avatar of the tamo guna, the mode of ignorance in the Vedic scriptures. It's described. But what, what does this mean, the mode of ignorance? Well, he's God. He's fully self-realized. So what ignorance is there for him? He has to imagine ignorance. Huh? It's just like in our yin-yang symbol. We begin with yang, only white. But then yin shows up in the middle. Oh, how did that happen? By imagination. Ignorance has to be created because it doesn't exist in the self. So when we create or imagine this ignorance, then we begin an alternation between knowledge and ignorance consciousness and unconsciousness, between yin and yang, the complementaries. Huh? So in this way, we create a vibration, a rotation, an alternation between the two states, knowledge and ignorance, yin and yang. And that creates vibration. Now, vibration if you've done any research into the art of manifestation, you know that vibration is the key to it. Vibration is the fundamental principle of all manifestation. So this vibration leads to the fabrication of a vortex. And we went over vortexes back in the uh, Secret of the Golden Flower. I'll put a link to it. And you should look into this because how do you create a vortex when there's nothing? By the alternation of consciousness and ignorance. Waking and sleeping. Knowing and not knowing. 
seeing and not seeing, yin and yang. And the alternation creates a vibration. Out of the vibration, you create a vortex. And as we went over back then also, the vortex creates fake matter. Actually, all matter is fake. <laughs> it's simply a vibration. Ask any quantum physicist, he'll be happy to explain to you how there is no matter, there's only energy. And because that energy is vibrating at a certain frequency, it seems solid, but it's really not. <laughs> how is that possible? Because the fact that it's vibrating creates a vortex. And the turbulence around the vortex creates fake matter. And that's why you can be swimming in the ocean and a wave that's not breaking will just pass right by you. But if you get caught in the break, oh boy, you get smashed. <laughs> you get hammered. <laughs> why? Because of the vortex, when the wave breaks, it seems to have more mass, more impact than the same amount of water when it's not breaking. So that's the power of a vortex, and that's how vortexes are used to create everything. The human body is a vortex. Huh? It's like a whirlpool, and everything goes in the mouth and out the other end, right? Just like a whirlpool, just like a vortex. It's a very, very sophisticated vortex, a very complex structure of interlocking vortexes, but that's all it is, folks. So anyway, <laughs> this leads to bodies, name and form, and the whole creation, as we went over in previous episodes. So this is how you come out of the non-dual state, by creating the world again. And that's all right. That's how it's done. You have to do it that way. You have to do it that way. Otherwise, you're just going to fall out, smash, boom, right onto the ground. Uh, and of course, that's very awkward. So rather than being obsessive and clinging to non-duality, you can come out of non-duality gracefully by creating your existence from nothing every single time. And what's the advantage? By learning this process of creation and doing it deliberately, now you have control over it. Now you can create things the way you want. Try to understand. Something that happens to us uncontrollably by the laws of nature. If we begin to do it deliberately, we get control over it. This is a psychological principle. Uh, if something happens to you, if life keeps giving you lemons, well then start making lemon juice, lemonade, <laughs> or whatever. Uh, take control of it. Do it deliberately. And then you can learn how to start it and stop it. Because after all, it's under your control. This is a great secret. I could probably do a whole series just on this alone. <laughs> There's so much here. You really need to come and see how this is done in everyday life, in reality. And then you can realize this wonderful teaching of Ananya Bhakti. Om Tat Sat. Om Harihi Om. Karunar Navamai Karudakadinal Gum Aruna Chalashivam Yidam